Hello, welcome to the Officio Spotlight podcast. My name is Simon Lipscomb and thank you very much for listening. Today we're talking about sustainability and net zero, which is a topic we've picked up before in previous podcasts, but specifically in the context of the UK National Health Service, which for listeners around the world is an organisation that employs 1.7 million staff, has an annual budget of £137 billion, making it the fifth largest employer in the world and the world's largest non-military public sector organisation. So it's an absolute privilege to get the opportunity to talk about the ambition and then the subsequent plan required to bring an organisation of that scale to net zero. So I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by two guests today in a slight diversion from the former, both of whom are at the forefront of developing and delivering that plan. Priya Bailey, who is the Director of Procurement, Transformation and Commercial Delivery, and Dr Nick Watts, who is Chief Sustainability Officer, and both of whom work for NHS England and NHS Improvement. So both, thank you so much for joining me for this conversation today. As I say, it's one I've been looking forward to for a while. By, I think, any measure, the NHS is an enormous, complicated organisation. So it would be great to perhaps start by maybe talking a little bit about the ambition and the targets that the NHS has put in place for this net zero agenda. And maybe if I could start with Nick on that. Simon, thank you for having us. Thank you for having us to discuss the most important health issue facing not just the country, but the planet. Eh? The climate crisis is a health crisis. The NHS, you're right, has taken that damn seriously. We have some commitments and we're pretty serious about them. If climate change really does threaten to undermine the core foundations of good health, and we are good healthcare professionals, so we've taken that science seriously, we've looked at it, we've understood the doubling of NHS facilities that you might expect to be on high-risk flood zones if you don't respond. We've looked at the tripling of the average duration of fatal heat waves that you expect in this country, and we've said, okay, well, we need to respond. If it really is that health crisis, and we think it is, then you respond as fast as you can, you sprint. You respond yeah. with a target and a commitment that is designed to be right at the very, very edge of going as fast as you can whilst not becoming unachievable. And that's what our targets are. So for the emissions we control directly, net zero by 2040 for our direct emission footprint. But okay. good healthcare professionals, good doctors, they taught me in medical school, understand that healthcare doesn't start or stop at the four walls of a clinic or a hospital. It, in fact, extends out into the broader determinants, into communities across the country, across the world. And so we have a global footprint target as well, net zero by 2045, not just for what happens within our four walls, but Priya Bailey, for what happens with everything we purchase and our suppliers and our friends and our partners across the entire world. Wow. Priya, so with a, an organisation of this scale and targets of that magnitude, where on earth do you even start to tackle that, right? That's an enormous challenge, I'm assuming. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the targets that Nick has outlined of 2040 and 2045, they seem far away, but actually it's how the level of change that means for the NHS. I mean, we have over 80,000 suppliers that we work with across the NHS, and those are from really large scale suppliers to really small scale suppliers. And so you start to think that actually in the next few years, how do we start to really work with every one of those suppliers to start to change the products that we buy, everything from establishing and our new buildings, we've got the new hospital build program, so new construction within the hospital, to almost some of the really small things, whether it's the dressings, whether it's the ambulances that we have, some of the work we've been doing around even just looking at the mileage across the NHS, you know, we're over 6 billion miles a year. When we start to look at our ambulances, when we start to look at our staff, when we start to look at our supply chain and our patients traveling towards hospital appointments, it is a significant challenge for the NHS, but also a significant responsibility for the NHS. I think with procurement specifically, with all of the things that we buy, all of those things have to go through procurement. I think everyone thinks about clinical services first, everyone thinks about finance being really important, but procurement is a real enabler and a lever where we can start to influence our entire supply chain to make those changes, because the size of this change for the NHS means that every single thing that we buy in the NHS will need to change. Everything that we buy, you know, nothing can stay as it is. Our clinical practices will be impacted as by this. The products and services that we purchase will need to change. With the NHS, we can't compromise on patients and patient safety and patient outcomes, yeah. but it is how we start to bring that together and how we bring our suppliers on that journey. And I think the big step that my team have done is around that supplier roadmap 
So again, what we're saying is whilst we're looking at the 2045 and we're looking at the 2040 deadline, what we started doing is bring it right back to what does it mean for this year? What are every single one of the milestones to get us there? Two things I will mention is part of what I'm sure Nick will talk about is the first green plan. So the first report that we came out, so the first healthcare to really put our ambition into state when we're going to yeah. be net zero. So again, really being on the forefront because we recognize, and whilst of course the NHS has, in the last few years has been focused on, on COVID, this is probably the biggest agenda that has not slowed down at all. This is the agenda that has really escalated and accelerated and seen, especially some of the clinicians coming forward to start to say, when we start to look at surgery, et cetera, these are the areas we need to start to focus on because of the big impact. So within the report that was published, one of the key announcements was we said around setting targets and outlining our ambitions. And so what we said was within that report that we will no longer contract with those suppliers that are not in line with our ambitions um, on targets by the end of the decade. So starting to bring forward that 2045 and that 2040 date to 2030. And again, building up to that 2030 is how do we start to influence every single one of these procurements? So from the 1st of April this year, every procurement within the NHS has a 10% weighting. And so this is around social value, but it also includes yeah. sustainability. And that's probably the biggest area we're focused on at the moment. So what you will see for across our suppliers and our supply chain is how we're starting to really recognize that sustainable and social value element within our procurements and working with every single one of our procurement teams to ensure that they're doing the right things. They're working in the same consistent way with our suppliers. But this is when we start to really see the shift. 10% weighting on a contract is substantial. Start to change the outcomes and show the brevity of the stance we're taking. Yeah. And Nick, you made a point at the start, which I thought was fascinating about this issue actually being a public health issue. In previous podcasts, we've talked about this, but actually never in that context. So a couple of questions. It, it would be great if you could kind of explain a little bit more about that. And also, I'd love to know really for both of you how you've found your way to this topic. Nick, I don't know. I'm assuming you're the first chief sustainability officer in the NHS. From an accent perspective, it doesn't sound like you're in the UK. So I'd just love to know. One, the question about the public health, but also both of your backgrounds as to how you're so close to this agenda and what it is that your passion and drive behind this as well. So you're right. I'm Australian. <laughs> God forbid they let me back in. I am um, I'm Australian. I'm a doctor. Trained all the way through that. Worked in a few different settings across the country down there. You learn very, very early on that the core foundations of good health don't necessarily sit within the four walls of a hospital and a good doctor, yeah. a good nurse, a good healthcare professional is engaging beyond just the things that are directly in their control. So your question to what extent or how in what ways is climate change related to health, to medicine, to public health, in what ways is it not? There was a core assumption when they designed the medical curriculum that I went through and when we structured the NHS, you know, a good century ago, that the environment was stable. It turns out that that was a poor assumption. It turns out that actually quite a lot of things are shifting and the shifting yeah. sands that we build these foundations on are moving a little too quickly. So a few examples. We've already talked a little bit about heat and heat wave. You expect to see an increase both in the frequency and in the intensity. Frequency matters and duration matters when it comes to heat waves because yeah. heat is fun if it's temporary and you can cool down. If you can't and it goes on for too long and you have a heart, that is already struggling with congestive heart failure, or if you have some kidneys that are already at stage four, so that are, you know, chronic kidney illness, a bit of heat is going to push them over into an acute kidney injury or into congested sort of heart that's going to overflow into your lungs. That's going to cause some serious health problems. Heat's a problem, but yeah. then you also see flood and you see storm, right? And you start to see sort of hurricanes and the direct impact, direct injury that you might see, the deaths and the mortality that you see from some of those extreme events, yes. But they're also disrupting services. Floods suck, right? They suck for individuals, for sort of human organization, because they disrupt things. So they disrupt a mental health patient who otherwise needs regular supply of medication. And we see three months after a flood in this country, really good studies of spikes in depression, spikes in schizophrenia, spikes in all sorts of affective disorders, because it has disrupted core services. And it has caused a fair bit of trouble for people, right? It has stopped kids going to school. It has stopped people having access to the things that they otherwise needed. It's caused serious damage to their property. And that has serious flow on effects to their mental health. Going a little bit further, you might also have assumed that food quality, water quality was going to be stable and climate change threatens to undermine that. Now, here yeah. we start to talk about things outside of England. 
But we do talk about 17 million additional kids under the age of five malnourished as a result of food insecurity from climate change by 2025 in sub-Saharan Africa, 23 million in Southeast Asia. Those are enormous numbers, together almost the size of the entirety of England. I'm from Australia. You never used to see endemic malaria. You used to know that if there was a fever and a return traveler, that yeah. was when you might ask questions about dengue fever. That was when you might ask questions about malaria. They are teaching you in Queensland right now, up in the northeast of Australia, it's no longer just fever and a return traveler. It is now fever in an Australian that, that hadn't left the country because we are seeing the Anopheles mosquito march down from Papua New Guinea, cross the bridge there, and Australia is having to prepare for that endemic situation. In fact, the modelling suggests it gets as far south as Sydney, um, which is, you know, the majority of the country. We've got to remember that malaria used to be endemic across Europe and indeed Germany, Spain, France. They are all preparing for their healthcare systems to have to take some of this stuff on. So the response is almost in what way does it not? There's one final bit there, though, that I just want to make sure we cover off, because Priya, you said something. We have to make sure that as we respond to climate change, we don't do anything to compromise patient care. I would flip that on its head and I would take it further. I would say we have to make sure that as we respond to climate change, we tackle the 36,000 deaths from air pollution that the UK experiences every year, that we invest in better services, better access for our patients across the country, that we make sure that we have healthier environments, more livable cities, more physical activity, healthier diets. If you can do all of those things as well, you actually flip it on your head. Climate change is this enormous threat to human health. The response to climate change is this enormous opportunity for public health. Yeah. And Priya, I'd love to understand your kind of connection to this topic. But also, it feels to me as a non-expert that actually the NHS's ambition on this topic is genuinely almost world leading. And I'd, I'd, I'd love to get your view on that. I'd love to kind of understand that a bit more. Yeah. I mean, I think what my team are very excited about is some of the conversations they've been having internationally, where some of the big countries where we've thought, you know, they're world leading, they're laying, no, yeah. we're looking to the UK. We're looking at all the great stuff that you're doing there. And we're using that to, in some ways, almost liberate people to do the same, to have yeah. those same conversations, because they're saying, well, if the NHS is this big organization can draw the line and has such really um, strong backing from our executive around this agenda, because we can see what the implications are of not doing it. People are saying this is really giving other countries that same opportunity to have those conversations. I think in terms of joining this conversation, one is Nick absolutely roped me into this. So <laughs> joking aside, I mean, we start to look at our supply chain. I talked about the six six 6.7 billion miles that we're looking at. This is where procurement has to be in the middle of this. It has to really be part of the forefront of this. I mean, 60% of our emissions come from our supply chain. And I think there's, on one part, from a procurement person, it's an exciting because I think this is about innovation and it's about market shaping. It's not just about buying the same as we've done. And this is a real opportunity when we start to work with some of the markets to say to them, these are some of the things we need. This is some of the change. And it's areas around reuse, remanufacturing. These are opportunities where we can start to have very clear conversations with suppliers. You know, we've got over 500,000 products on our catalog. If we're going to change 500,000 products, it's ensuring, one, this isn't, it isn't a barrier, that we don't lose good innovation, we don't lose good products. But often the innovation comes from small businesses. So often it's just the SMEs where they trial something, where they're changing, and it's all about how they can come into the NHS market. So I think there's some real opportunities from a procurement professional is yeah. to start work with some of those businesses. And I think last year, one of the great initiatives taken forward by, by Nick and his team and supported by, by my team was around where we were able to support 10 interventions, so 10 new innovations around sustainability and around net zero emissions. And some of that was within the theatre space. Some of that was around clinical areas, which is then absolutely starts to change. And we don't want just a single supply in that space. What we want is multiple suppliers, because actually if we can start to change clinical procedures to be more sustainable, more environmentally friendly, then it shows others that actually they can do the same. It shows others that how can we start to replicate that across the whole of the NHS? I mean, I think my summary is this is a real opportunity for procurement. I think this is a, it's a completely different market change. And procurement is a neighbor. We're the biggest contributor, the biggest influencer. 
which is absolutely why I'm why I'm leading this and supporting Nick on this. Priya, you, your point about innovation is spot on. It's so, so important, right? There's there's two parts of this. One is throwing down the gauntlet and saying we want to do business with our partners, with companies, with countries around the world that are moving yeah. at the same pace as us. But the other side of that is entirely the opportunity for the British life sciences industry, the opportunity for the NHS, for our healthcare system to innovate and to become that real center of global excellence. This is the direction of healthcare in general, and we are at the forefront of it. You mentioned the small business innovation competition. I wanted to draw out a couple of examples of what that looks like. Two or three weeks from now, we're going to have the first flight of some fully electric drones delivering medicines across to the Isle of Wight, delivering cancer medication far, far more efficiently (laughs) just at the right moment. It's such a cool example of a low carbon way of delivering medication to a population that otherwise would not have access to it. Priya, you mentioned the zero emission ambulance. What you forgot to mention is that it's the world's first zero emission <laughs> ambulance. It didn't exist before, before Freya, you came along, before our friends and colleagues in the ambulance team came along. We have the world's first. We have the world's second as well. That is damn cool. <laughs> Countries around the world are taking a look saying, God, we didn't even think that was possible until yeah. the NHS showed us how. Yeah. Um, the other kinds of things we've seen, there's some cool apps, some cool... They're more process innovations, but they are process innovations that help increase the efficiency of how our patients gain access to surgery, to their appointments, to their pre-surgical checks. Improves efficiency. Our patients love it. Our clinicians love it. And it reduces carbon. Priya, you, you've been doing a huge amount of work on PPE, on masks over the last two years, a big hot topic. One of my favorite innovations <laughs> there is a group of people that are looking at just different products, different materials you can use to decrease the carbon of that. Yes, and that's kind of cool. And then people say, okay, now how do we deal with that waste? I saw something and I need to go and look into it in more detail. But this idea of melting the thing down, melting the waste down, using the recycling that plastic, I think it was down in Cornwall. They were taking the plastic, turning it into trash pickers, giving it to the kids at one of the local schools and they were wandering around picking up the trash on the beach. Have I got that right? I think it was in Cornwall. We'll have to check that <laughs> But especially down in the southwest, there are some big, some really yes. great initiatives yes. around. We were talking earlier about even local food, you yeah. know. So again, where people are starting to look at, and people want to know, you know, where is the source of what we're buying for our hospital, and actually, how can we start to really think about that? So being much more environmentally friendly. So yes, and I think it's really exciting because we're saying to people, we want to see the examples, we want to support you on the examples. Tell us about these initiatives people are being more energized and people are saying these are some of the big things we could change for some of the initiatives where people are looking at sort of more renewable energy. Maybe the investment isn't enough for a small hospital, but this is where some of the conversations with the center is about actually there is a longer term benefit here and how can we support you to drive this forward? Yeah. And guys, for one, I'm very pleased that this agenda is in the hands of two such passionate people, right? And I, uh, talking to you, I believe (laughs) completely that you will deliver by 2045. But to talk a little bit about the other side, I mean, this is hugely challenging, right? In terms of what do you see as the risks? If you don't get to that target, what will be the kind of things that you think will have caused that? What are the real worries? Let me start by saying, will the NHS hit this target? By definition... It is a 50-50 bet. By definition, we are moving as quickly as we can. And the second we get to 100% certain that we can hit that target, we're going to move the target forward and we're going to start to run at this problem faster. If it's a crisis, it's a health emergency, you treat it that way. And so the target is set to be right on the cusp of ambitious but feasible. I think we will. I think we'll absolutely hit it. If we don't, what do you do with that? Well, you don't pack up and go home. You keep pushing. If you shoot for the moon and you manage only a 95% reduction in your emissions, damn, that is impressive. You have transformed the face of medicine and healthcare across the country and the world in, in the process. The targets are good and they're important for you know some big, important political reasons. But what is more important is what did you do at 9 a.m. yesterday to yeah. reduce your emissions? How did you innovate? How did you transform medicine yesterday, today, the next day? What will the reason be? It will not be because we didn't have the political will. We've got that. It will not be because our staff weren't passionate and energized about this. We ask every three months 
1.4 million of us, hey, what do you care about? Nine out of 10 of them shout back, I want to work for an organization that is more environmentally sustainable. I was up in yeah. Manchester just a day or two ago talking with some of our anesthetists at one of the Royal College events. I said, hey, I think you guys should reduce the proportion of a certain drug you use, a certain high carbon drug you use to only 5%. At the moment, it's a little high. You could reduce it down, reduce carbon. It would be better for your patients after their mm -hmm. operation. The College of Anesthetists shouted back, nonsense, Nick, you're not being ambitious enough. We think we can get rid of it altogether. We don't need this drug anymore. Medicine has moved on. So it will not be because of that. It may be because the NHS is big and bureaucratic and moving those sorts of mm -hmm. things is tough. And this stuff yeah. is complex. And so that will take a little bit of time but it will not be because there hasn't been the passion from our 1.4 million staff. And I think just to build on what Nick has said, I mean, what's probably ramping up the ambition is after we've set all of our targets, what we started to see is some of the hospitals, especially some of the big hospitals, start to declare that they'll be net zero by 2030. And so immediately we start going, okay, right what could we by 2030 really okay and so one I think it was UCLH was the first to declare and then at least sort of five others after that started doing the same so I have a sustainability procurement forum which is sort of representation of procurement leads but it's also like the Royal College of Nursing allied health professionals sort of all sit on that and I suddenly saw the membership of that grow but it wasn't growing by procurement people it was growing by clinicians right and so again and that's and that's the shift so we we'll probably have a forum now, which is we started off about like twenty-five people. It was over sixty people now. That happens every six weeks, and it is a real half and half of clinicians and procurement people. And again, this is the conversation from the clinicians around. These are some of the areas where we're seeing some of the initiatives. This is what we want to drive. Could we look yeah. at this area? And that's where Nick is saying it's not about the will or the want and the desire to this. What we're starting to see is clinicians coming to us to say these are some of the areas where we absolutely either see the way so we can see some of the changes or could we look at products around this because this is where we start to see more of the emissions coming through but it's how we start to change our demand how local demand that people are starting to look at what the NHS carries out but with a different view with a different lens I think it is it's that passion and ambition that we're seeing coming through from all across the whole of the NHS that we're going to do this and we're going to do it right so yes <laughs> and it's fascinating it's, it's really heartening actually I mean I'm kind of wind this conversation down feeling really positive right like talking to both of you you've got so much energy about it but then you know there's examples of hospitals wanting to push it forward Priya to your point 60 percent of the emissions in the supply chain are you seeing the same level of positivity and proactivity to this agenda from your suppliers so I also have a supplier forum for exactly that reason so exactly around the trade associations and I do a lot of consultation so I refer to the start around the supplier roadmap so outlining to the suppliers what are almost the steps that we're going to get to 2030 and then to 2040 and, 20, and 2045. But it's ensuring that we're engaging with suppliers, we're going at the right pace as well. So we're not leaving them behind. And for example, with all the targets that we've set, part of it has been around the SME agenda, where part of those targets, we've built in a two-year grace period for the SMEs. Yeah. So again, it's ensuring that we're not leaving anyone behind. It's being really clear around, this is where we're going. This is the expectation of how we get there. I think the ask from the suppliers is around consistency of message. So again, whilst I may put in place a target, so we have said about the 10% waiting from the 1st of April, it's how we get that same level of consistency across the whole of, of the NHS. So someone doesn't want to be that they're procuring for a service in one area and we're asking for a level of conditions and then asking in a different area and we're asking for something else. And that again is what my team's role is, is that ensuring whether we're asking for an environmental impact assessment, whether we're looking at how we're measuring our carbon emissions. It's about bringing that consistency across the whole of the NHS to support the suppliers taking this forward. And also work with the suppliers and especially the trade associations around where some of the areas where they think it is going to be challenging and what do they need from us around the support. For a lot of the suppliers, they're really clear that if the NHS demand starts to shift, they will start to shift their model. What yeah. they can't have is part of the NHS is making a shift and the other is left behind. And I think absolutely, if people are going to spend their time and their money innovating and making this change to a more environmentally friendly product, then absolutely the NHS demand shift needs to support them on that journey. 
But I think our suppliers were really engaged with the suppliers to help them and to support them on this journey going forward. You are right, Priya. You are entirely right to focus on, on our sort of SME colleagues and partners here, right? I think that's in part because there's some challenges there, but I think that's where the innovation is really going to be damn exciting. Mm-hmm. For half a second, if I can, if you'll permit me, Simon, also some of the bigger companies that we procure from as well. So the NHS, very, very clear. Net zero by 2045 for us means for our suppliers as well. And we, Priya, you've talked through the roadmap that we expect from our suppliers. It's a challenge. It's not going to be an easy thing for us to all go and do. Mm-hmm. Priya, you, you laid down that gauntlet and the response that came from AstraZeneca, that came from GSK, that came from Johnson & Johnson, that came from ABHI, ABPI, those trade industries, Medtronic, Smith & Nephew, from 15 of our largest, most critical suppliers was yes. We can do this. We've already started down that journey. We're going to shift our targets in line and we're going to start to sprint at the climate crisis because we understand Mm -hmm. the health crisis. Their commitments alone in the entirety represent emissions the the size of the country of Belgium. That is such a cool thing to start Mm -hmm. to see them taking on. Priya, it's because of, I think, the leadership that you, your team, because of the leadership the NHS had that we're starting to see people run at this. It's a really cool thing. So the response assignment is, that looks challenging, but we understand it. Yeah. Healthcare, let's get going. And presumably that's of enormous benefit to other healthcare systems around the world. So the NHS is leading the way on this, but presumably if you can push the bigger suppliers to make real change, that's a benefit to every healthcare system in every, every country and everywhere. First, there was one healthcare system with a net zero target. It was the NHS. 12 months later, there were 15 healthcare systems. Mm. with net zero targets. Yeah. I was down in Spain. I caught the train down to Spain. I meet with their Minister of Health to talk about Spain's net zero target. I've been on the phone with the German Federal Ministry. They are reorganizing their departments there to take this on. The French are hiring for new experts in what they call the ecological crisis within their Department of Health and Social Justice. There is a new unit within HHS over in the United States. Mm. God forbid, even in Western Australia, a sustainable <laughs> development unit within the Department of Health. You're you're right, Simon, this is the direction that everyone is heading. And let's be clear, the NHS can't get to net zero unless everyone heads along this journey with us. So it's critical. Yeah, Guys, it's such a fascinating (laughs) conversation. As I say, I I genuinely wrap up feeling really positive. I I started Mm -hmm. thinking, oh, this is big and challenging, but meeting you guys and your passion and and what's already been achieved and what could be achieved and the implications of that are really heartening, actually. I leave this conversation really buoyant and happy. I thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us about this. It's a fascinating conversation, huge topic, and genuinely delighted you guys are running Mm -hmm. this. I feel like we're in safe hands, right? Thank you. Thank you, Simon. It's been wild. Thanks. If you enjoyed this podcast, please click the follow button on your chosen podcast platform. We'd also absolutely love to hear your views. So please do leave us a review on those platforms or indeed send me a message on LinkedIn. And we'll be back soon for another discussion with senior industry figures.